In today's video, we're covering index funds for beginners. Here's our agenda. In part one, we will learn index fund basics. And in part two, we will cover pros and cons of index funds. In part three, I'll share some of my opinions on who index funds work well for and who they don't. In part four, we will answer some index fund FAQs. Now, you should care about index funds because as this study of millionaires by ESI Money points out, most millionaires use them. And I think if I were a millionaire, I could hook that up too. And so you know, I'm not just talking the talk. I'm a self-made millionaire and I use index funds. But today we're going beyond theory because in part five, I'm going to invest $1,500 of my own money in an index fund based portfolio during this video. It's right here, right now as we sit. Now, we will actually use more than just index funds for this portfolio. In fact, the simple three fund investment allocation that I will make with you today closely models what I used to make myself a millionaire over the last five years. And we'll check back in a year to see how the investment has progressed. Therefore, if you want to learn how to invest like a millionaire, consider subscribing so you don't miss the 12 month update and let's dive in. Let's break the term indexed fund down into its two parts. We can start by thinking of an index as just a list. In fact, you could think of it in terms of sports. Here's an index of the world's 100 most valuable sports franchises as an example. Except in the investing world, instead of a list of sports teams, we're talking about a list of companies. And that's where the fund part comes in. An index fund takes that list of companies and pools the publicly traded stocks of all of them into a single mutual fund so that anyone can buy stock in that entire group of companies with a single click. The most common example is an S&P 500 index fund. These are simply a grouping of the stocks of 500 of the largest publicly traded companies that are based in the United States. Many investment firms offer their own versions of an S&P 500 index fund, and they all do that same thing. Now, besides making that large group of companies available for you to invest with a single purchase, those firms also maintain their index fund to actually match the top 500 US companies. And they do that because they have to. The list of which companies are the top 500, of course, changes over time as companies perform better or worse. And so the investment firm does that buying and selling maintenance work transparently behind the scenes for us. Let's start with the cons. Con number one, by definition, an index fund essentially is the market that it tracks. So the very strategy of being the market means that you are foregoing the potential of performing differently than the market. Therefore, the first con is that an index fund cannot beat the market. Con number two, let's say for example that you do want to invest in a broad index of US companies, but you believe the automotive sector is going to perform poorly over the next few years. With an index fund, you cannot remove a specific segment, nor any specific companies. Poorly performing companies can absolutely fall out of the index fund naturally, but it can take several years and you cannot accelerate that process. Therefore, the second con of an index fund is lack of control. A third con is that the indices don't perfectly track the index, and there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that, as we mentioned, the fund management companies have to manually buy and sell the companies that naturally come and go from whatever index we're talking about, and the fund managers cannot do that instantly. This means that if the index called the S&P 500 goes up 5%, you may only get 4.98% in your index fund, and that difference is what's called quote unquote tracking error. The second reason the fund won't exactly match the index are the fees charged by the fund. Now, it's only appropriate that these funds make a fair profit for the tool they're providing us. But for any investment, the size of the fee matters tremendously, and everyone will have their own definition of what is quote unquote fair. We'll get into the details of fees in the FAQ section. The final con that I'll mention has to do with what happens during market volatility, especially market decline. Because an index fund is designed to track an index, when the overall market that index tracks declines in value, your investment will decline in value too. With an index fund, there's no one who's going to sell this fund for you when that decline starts to occur. Now with the cons out of the way, let's look at the pros, and there are quite a few. 
Index funds are a single purchase. They don't need constant monitoring or rebalancing. They're a set it and forget it approach that reduces stress and saves time. This all adds up to the first pro of index funds, which is simplicity. There are index funds that require only a few hundred dollars for their initial purchase. They take only a few clicks to buy after you open a brokerage account, and this makes them easy to get started with, which is their second pro. Next, index funds typically have the lowest fees in the investing world. This means the maximum amount of money possible stays invested and stays compounding. Therefore, the third pro of index fund investing is being low cost. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. The diversification of index funds across companies and even across different industries reduces risk compared to buying individual stocks even if those stocks are Apple, Google, or Microsoft. The value of an index fund cannot be crushed by a single competitor introducing a new product, by a single fraudulent CEO committing financial crimes, or by simple changes in customer preferences devaluing a business. I used to work at Abercrombie, so pretty good folder. All this adds up to the fourth pro of index fund investing, which is safety. Next, research indicates that an S&P 500 index fund has made money for everyone who's kept one over a 20-year period. But that's the worst case scenario. And over any 30-year period, the average growth is 9 to 11% per year, which is enough to make almost anyone rich if they stick to it. One of the cons of index funds was that they by definition cannot beat the market. However, Remember that most actively managed funds don't beat the market either. Therefore, the fifth pro of index funds is long-term likelihood of winning. Here's a related financial wake-up call. Fortune found that 1,700 people per day in America are becoming millionaires. Imagine joining that group or going well beyond because you used the right investment strategy. Therefore, I'd next like to offer some of my opinions on how I think index funds fit into various groups of people. If you appreciate the separation of fact from opinion, smash the like button and let's now talk about index funds and everyday people. By putting into place especially automated index fund investing, you have 1. Transparency, meaning you always know what you own. Two, you have consistency. Over long periods, index funds are very consistent, and you can typically verify the performance of any of those funds going back many decades. Three, index funds are tax efficient and fee efficient, so you don't have to worry about meaningful amounts of your money getting siphoned off by someone else. And all those things in turn get you some non-trivial life benefits. First, you could spend the time and emotional energy you're not spending on worrying about your investments on something like a side business to increase the capital which you have available to invest. Or you could just spend more time with your family and enjoy life while you're here. But what about people who like to actively manage their investments? Well, there are also some index funds that are smaller than an entire stock market. So an active investor could trade these sector-based index funds. If they feel, for example, healthcare or real estate will likely do well in the coming months or years, they can buy a fund that focuses on those sectors. Then, when the investor wants to be able to sell during forecasted periods of downturn, they can do that and rotate into another sector. Now, there's also room for a hybrid approach here, whereby a hobbyist investor could put most of their money into a broad index fund, then use smaller amounts of money to actively trade sector-based index funds. This approach allows an investor the opportunity to make above market gains, but without putting their entire financial future at risk. Let me know how you think index funds may or may not fit into your investment plans in the comments. FAQ number one, are index funds widely used? About 45% of the total capital invested in the US stock market is invested in index funds. The next closest category is actively managed funds, estimated to be about 25%. This makes index funds the most widely used investment tool for investing in the US stock market. FAQ number two, where do I buy index funds? When you go to buy an index fund, you need two things. You need a fund to buy and a place to buy it. Because of their popularity, you have many choices in both of these categories. Where to buy includes places like Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, Webull, E-Trade, and so on. FAQ number three, how to buy. Once you've opened your account, you have two basic ways to buy an index fund. The traditional way is via a mutual fund. Mutual fund index funds are bought and sold once per day at an end of the day price only. 
Some mutual index funds will have a higher minimum purchase amount, such as up to $3,000. But there's also a newer way, which is called an ETF, or Exchange Traded Fund. ETF index funds can be bought and sold anytime traditional stock markets are open. ETFs are priced constantly during that period, and as mentioned prior, investors can more easily then use limit orders to buy and sell at their desired prices. ETFs will often have lower minimums, perhaps a few hundred dollars, making them easier to get started in investing. But in the long run, there's going to be so little difference between the two that it won't matter much for everyday investors. FAQ number four, what to buy. We've focused a bit on broad market funds like the S&P 500 index funds, but there are other types as well. First, there are bond funds. Like a stock index fund, bond index funds represent specific bond indices. Bonds are essentially a loan that you make to an institution, such as a company or government agency, and in return, they agree to pay you interest on the loan that you gave them. Next are target date funds. Target date funds are designed to provide an investment portfolio that automatically adjusts its contents as retirement approaches. Therefore, people pick a specific fund based on their personally targeted retirement date. These funds aim to balance growth and risk over time, transitioning to a more conservative allocation as the retirement date nears. And there are market cap funds. Market capitalization funds group companies based on their size, small, mid, and large cap index funds. And finally, there are sector-based funds, Sector-based funds focus on investing in stocks within specific industry sectors of the economy. They aim to provide targeted exposure to sectors such as technology, healthcare, financials, energy, and so on. FAQ number five, what about fees? The last thing we'll cover before actually making our investments are fees. How big of a deal are fees? I love playing around with compound interest calculators. To see if we should care about fees, let's use this one. We'll use an age range from 25 to 55, or 30 year period, and enter an investment value of $500 a month. First, let's use 9%, and we can see that the account comes out to $915,000. Pretty impressive. Next, we'll use 10%, and the account comes out to $1,130,000, a difference of $214,000. So, seemingly tiny percentages make a surprisingly big difference when it comes to compounding math. But what is a reasonable goal for low fees? Typical fees for an actively managed mutual fund could be the 1% we just used per year or higher. An index fund will often have a management fee of about one-tenth of that, say 0.1%, or even less. This percentage is called the expense ratio. So for my $1,500 account, an expense ratio of 0.1% would remove about $1.50 a year in fees. Anything below 0.1% I consider really good. In my mind, anything at 0.5% or above starts getting into that 93% of actively managed funds that cannot beat an index fund. Part five, the fun part, buying our $1,500 portfolio. We will start with a Vanguard S&P 500 Index Fund ETF, and it will be about 70% of our total portfolio. The symbol is VOO, it's around $500 a share, and the expense ratio is a fantastic 0.03%. Next, we will use an international stock index fund, also from Vanguard, and we'll use about 20% of our capital for that. The symbol is VEU, it is also an ETF, it's about $60 a share, and the expense ratio is a still very good 0.07%. Now, at this point, a traditional index fund portfolio would fill in the remaining 10% with a bond index fund, but bonds have been losing actual buying power due to inflation for many years, so the math just doesn't work. And second, this is the digital era, and I want my investment portfolio to move into the 21st century with me. So for my remaining 10%, I'll be buying the Bitwise Bitcoin ETF Trust. Now, some of you may consider Bitcoin to be too risky or unrelated to index funds, and that's completely fine. I am not advising you on what to do. But you should know that Bitcoin was a major contributor to my financial growth over the last five years. Now this is a spot ETF, meaning that the Bitwise Trust does actually remove Bitcoin from the market. If you want to own Bitcoin with little to no hassle and you already have a brokerage account, this is a great way to do it. The expense ratio here is 0.2%, which is a touch higher than an index fund, but dramatically lower than the other Bitcoin ETFs, which often charge around 1.5%. However, if you are technical, you can buy and store Bitcoin yourself for zero fees of any kind. And now Bitcoin is in our portfolio. And here's the pending order page for our total portfolio. 
up or down, I cannot wait to check on it with you in the future. If you'd like to continue learning about finance and investing, well, you can check out this video right here.